Welcome everyone to the 2DCC webinar series. Today we have Dr. Andre Zakuchia from NREL. Today he'll be talking about research data infrastructure um, for material science. Um, you know, we, we have concerns about uh, high throughput data and today Dr. Zakuchia will talk about some inorganic thin film materials and how they're collecting those data and best practices at NREL. Um, Andre, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Kevin, for, for this uh, great introduction and also uh, for the invitation to present this webinar. I uh, really much, very much admire the work that happens in 2DCC, uh, the types of things that you do, and was very pleased to learn that uh, uh, you are interested in uh, data infrastructure, data preservation, and, and uh, related issues. Uh, before I go into the content of my talk, I have one um, special disclaimer to make today. Um, I am Ukrainian, and uh, as you might have seen on the news yesterday, Russia started a war on Ukraine. Uh, so it's very difficult for me today about uh, to talk today about research data infrastructure when the civil infrastructure in Ukraine, such as roads and and cities, um, and and airports, are being bombed and shelled, and people are dying. Um, I will honor my commitment of accepting this invitation and present. Um, the slides to the best of my ability today because my mental state is, is very difficult uh, right now and I also do hope that the uh, United States and the rest of the world will um, honor their commitment as well to preserve the current state of the world and current state of the order and will um, uh, react to this uh, very unfortunate situation uh, appropriately. Um, at this point uh, I guess I just want to take 30 minutes 30 second uh, break, silence moment to uh, acknowledge the people that have already died in this stupid war and uh, just take a breath uh, and then I'll start my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So um, again, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. I come here from National Renewable Energy Lab, which is located in Golden, Colorado. Uh, by means of introduction, NREL is uh, one of the DOE-funded uh, national labs uh, that has been around for more than 40 years. Uh, started the Solar Energy Research Institute, or CIRI, very well known for its research in photovoltaic uh, uh, devices and modules, uh, but also expanded since in the last uh, couple of decades into wind, bio, batteries, and many other areas. Uh, this here is a picture of annual campus, um, which I'm very proud to be uh, a part of. Um, and uh, on the background here, you could see Golden Colorado, where it's located, as well as Rocky Mountains, which are not these hills here, but rather the big peaks uh, behind them. Uh, as another uh, piece of introduction, uh, I myself at annual uh, lead the materials discovery team. Uh, the research aim of our team is to discover new materials for energy applications of various kinds. Uh, traditionally, uh, like in many parts of annual, it has been new photovoltaic absorbers and contacts uh, for solar cells. Uh, more recently, uh, turned uh, our attention to photoelectrochemical water splitting. We also do work on energy conversion materials such as thermoelectrics, piezoelectrics, and ferroelectrics in materials discovery team. Uh, energy storage, including uh, lithium ion batteries, materials for uh, fuel cells. Um, and electrolyzers. Uh, recently, we also started working a lot on materials for semiconductors for power electronics and for neuromorphic quantum computing. Some of the examples I'll show today would be related to these areas. And beyond these applied topics, we also do foundational material science uh, as it pertains to high throughput experimentation. Um, HTE stands for high throughput mutation. People sometimes call it also combinatorial research. And because we use these high throughput methods for many, uh, for discovering materials for many of these applications, uh, we also do method, basic method development um, as it pertains to synthesis characterization, data handling uh, in high throughput experiments. Here are just some examples of, uh, uh, or maybe highlights of the high throughput materials uh, data related um, facilities that we developed in the last uh, couple of years, including high throughput experimental materials database, uh, Combeager, which is the open source um, data analysis package for high volumes of experimental um, high throughput data as well as research data infrastructure, which uh, will be uh, one of the main sections of my talk today. But I'll mention all of these aspects uh, going forward. 
By means of a uh, more technical introduction, high throughput uh, experiments for materials discovered in NREL uh, can be summarized in this flowchart here. Uh, we do a lot of combinatorial synthesis using physical vapor deposition methods, RF cost patterning of oscillator position, MBE as well. Uh, we have broad range of uh, synthesis chambers that can handle different chemistries so that our chambers stay clean or at least don't contaminate each other in big ways, uh, including uh, uh, nitrites, sulfides, phosphides, oxides, uh, uh, lithium containing materials, and so forth. Uh, all of these chambers have a common feature of having uh, multiple um, precursor sources that let us create a composition gradients across sample libraries and make multiple samples in this way. We take the sample libraries out of the reactors and um, perform spatial result characterization on many of them uh, for basic materials properties like composition and structure, as well as for uh, optical or transport or catalytic properties, depending on the application that we target in a particular project. Um, so that's a core of, of research that we do in materials discovery team uh, with high throughput experiments at NREL. Um, and a little bit outside on a collaborating site, uh, we do have a strong collaborations in many theoretical groups that often feed us with their hypothesis and uh, point to interesting materials areas to explore. And we do uh, feed out from our research the best and most promising candidates of materials that we discovered for uh, practical application driven optimization uh, outside of composition gradients or temperatures or other things that are simple to screen in combinatorial experiments. To just give you a uh, visual scale of, of the research that is happening in annual in our facilities in material discovery area, here are just uh, some pictures of a few selected uh, synthesis and characterization. Um, uh, tools. So as you can see here, we have these multiple sputtering chambers called combinatorial deposition chamber one, three, two, and, and four, and so forth, uh, for different chemistries, as well as number of different characterization tool, all, uh, each of which have uh, spatial result stages for performing automated measurements. Uh, part of this slide is uh, to kind of just uh, put a face to a name, so to speak, or give you real pictures rather than cartoon of what we're doing here, but part of it is uh, also invitation for collaboration. If there are uh, specific materials that you would like to uh, have grown that you may not have uh, ability to grow in your own lab, or there are specific characterization tools that we have, and your samples require spatial results mapping for uniformity or non-uniformity reason of your sample that could grow, we are very open for these co collaborations. And, and please reach out to me in the end of this talk or after it um, uh, with specific questions. Uh, if there are some tools you're interested in, in, in working with or materials that you need. All right, so uh, a lot of things that we do with this combinatorial research have to do with uh, single materials, right? We have composition gradients across the sample libraries. We, we have temperature gradients and other gradients. Um, I'm not going to talk any about of that research today. Uh, I figure that for uh, this specific webinar into DCC, um, where, which is very interested in 2D materials research, I give you an example of how a high throughput of combinatorial research can be applied uh, to 2D materials and heterostructures of 2D materials specifically. And uh, this is just to an, an example to show you a glimpse of research of, of what we do so that um, uh, the rest of my talk that have to do with data infrastructure and uh, would, would make a better sense. So I don't think this introduction is needed here. The point of the slide to say is that the 2D materials are very important. 2D heterostructure are made perhaps even more interesting from the point of view of flexibility that they offer in uh, non-epitaxial van der Waal interface formation and the properties that emerge from this. Many 2D layer materials exist uh, and, and stacking them in, in various sequences as was uh, in, uh, described in this review paper um, could, could, could be really promising and is really promising research direction. Uh, however, the exfoliation, manual exfoliation process of these materials, which not everybody but many research uh, researchers in the field do, as well as their um, stacking is, is very time consuming um, and not particularly scalable. I know that uh, you and many other uh, groups around the world explore, of course, much more uh, scalable material synthesis processes. And one of these uh, types of processes that actually has been around for a long time, since the end of 20th century, is um, annealing of amorphous design precursors. It has been pioneered by Professor David Johnson, the University of Oregon. He and his team since the time has shown a number of um, Super lattices is deposited by alternating the positions of uh, in a PVD chamber, of operation chamber, of uh, amorphous uh, layers, monolayers, di layers of, of these uh, layered selenite and tellurite materials, uh, then annealed to form um, custom uh, arbitrary sequence heterostructures. 
Now, where we came into this research is realizing that uh, one specific element here that is very important to the materials but has not been uh, covered by, by uh, Dave Johnson's work is um, all the different kinds of sulfites. Uh, there are so many different uh, uh, sulfide to materials that it seems um, expanding this chemistry in, in, in this approach in that direction would be uh, very productive. So uh, we've tried adopting the synthesis uh, uh, of the kind that uh, uh, this group is doing to uh, sulfides. Uh, we have a sulfide sputtering chamber dedicated to sulfides where we're able to uh, show this. So we basically have uh, reactive uh, plumes from uh, multiple targets here, as well as sulfur plume to modulate the precursors. We deposit the amorphous stacks of the materials by controlling the uh, deposition using quartz cluster microbalances and, and, and shattering the uh, different sources uh, using computer programmed uh, um, in instruments here and, and yield these precursors in order to uh, Crystallize them. Um, additional advantage uh, that we bring here as the high throughput combinatorial research group is that we could arrange these uh, sources here on the left at the angle with respect to the substrate. And in this way, uh, create uh, constant composition gradients along the diagonal of this uh, two inch by two inch square library or com constant composition, uh, constant thickness gradient along the, uh, the, the circle here. So it means that on a, any given simple library that is here two inch by two inch, we can deposit multiple different stacking sequence of uh, super lattices we should be able to, uh, and also uh, different different periods of these super, super lattices. So that was our initial idea. This is a demonstration of how it works, how the high throughput experimental combinatorial research can be applied to 2D materials and, and their stacks. Uh, this is a picture of uh, this two inch by two inch library that I mentioned uh, with the uh, picture of where the precursors have been placed. So sulfur has been uh, deposited everywhere here, here uniformly. Tantalum was deposited from the right and tin sulfide was deposited from the left. And this is the four points at which the X-ray diffraction here from these stacks have been collected. So this is low angle X-ray diffraction uh, looking at some um, total uh, 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 characterization of this interface and to determine their thicknesses. And then this is the uh, longer range X-ray diffraction from 12 to 40 degrees showing uh, sequences of peaks here that extend all the way from zero, zero three, and these are the earlier peaks here, for example, to 0, 0, 010 for this particular uh, super lattice of the three one stacking sequence, and then uh, of all the way to the 12 order peak and 14 order peak for these uh, uh, super lattices of tin sulfide, titanium disulfide, that are 4, 1 and 5, 1 uh, in sequence. So this shows really the control uh, of, uh, uh, first of all, the ability to grow the sulfide uh, materials in this way, uh, that are layered. Second, um, uh, ability of using high throughput experimental methods to generate multiple uh, super lattice stacking sequences on a single library. And this research, if you'd like more details, has been published in that letters last, uh, last year or two years ago. Uh, just a few more uh, extra diffraction slides uh, for better optimized high quality materials. You can see here very nice uh, uh, and sharp peaks, very good uh, refill. Uh, uh, refinement uh, of these super lattices. And this is actually in-plane diffraction here uh, that, that uh, where all the peaks can be indexes, indexed to uh, one of the two uh, polytypes of tan tantalum sulfide or um, tin sulfide. Of course, uh, there are always caveats and life is never perfect. Um, looking at these um, stacks in the high uh, resolution transmission electron microscopy, you could see here the numbers of, uh, you, you can see, uh, that the second that I was talking about, so one layer of tin sulfide and, and, and four, three layers of tin sulfide. However, you also see a number of stacking faults here and variations. Uh, for example, looking here at this EDX scan here, you could see that uh, mostly it uh, across this line, mostly this alternating sequence of tin and tantalum works, but there are a couple of uh, defects here uh, where, where the stacking fault occurs. So there's definitely room for improvement uh, in both synthesis procedures as well as annealing procedures here to make more perfect materials. But all in all, um, this technique does work. And um, hopefully, this couple of slides convince you that high throughput e experimental research um, is not only useful for, for materials development, but also can be adopted to much more complex problems, uh, such as the uh, 2D materials and their header structures uh, that I showed today, as well as uh, other things. For example, we work on uh, use similar methods for device optimization and device development, not necessarily materials developing itself. All right, so uh, that's just a quick glimpse of the uh, research, scientific part of the research that we do that I hope would be of interest to the audience um, here and to this venue. 
Uh, and that man is, uh, to just give you an example of pretext of um, um, why we need research data infrastructure and experimental databases and how these things are implemented at NL. Obviously doing these types of um, experiments with thin films or with superlators that I showed you leads to very large number of samples. Uh, we could create multiple samples on a single library and we have, uh, we can grow multiple sample libraries per day and we have multiple chambers in which the sample libraries can be grown. Uh, in addition to that, we have multiple characterization tools, each of which can be used to measure uh, these different samples. So we are really, uh, over the last 10 years, thought very hard about how to um, arrange these data flows and how to arrange our workflows in the way uh, in which our research productivity in terms of scientific insights and publications would not be limited by the uh, bottlenecks of, of data handling and data analysis. It's great to have a high throughput uh, depositions. Almost anyone can do it in their own lab. It's even better to have high throughput characterization uh, where instruments can um, measure properties without human intervention. And it's necessary and even more important to have appropriate data handling uh, capability because uh, unless all three of these links of the chain are working in sequence with the same throughput, um, the, uh, the throughput of the research enterprise as a whole is limited by uh, its bottleneck. Uh, so let me show you on the, uh, let me, let's now focus for the next couple of slides on the last point of that, um, last link of the chain on the, uh, uh, research data infrastructure. So um, this work has been performed here in collaboration uh, with uh, Kevin Talley, who was the first author on the patterns paper we published in the end of last year that I think uh, um, uh, got me this invitation to present this webinar, as well as uh, with contributions from many other people who uh, over the last uh, decade or more at NL have uh, built and expanded this uh, research data infrastructure, such as Robert White, Caleb Phillips, and, and others. Uh, they like to say these people, uh, and I completely agree with their statement, that data plumbing is a glorious work that supports modern data science. Uh, so unless uh, the uh, kind of boring and glory thing that I'm going to show you in the next slides are done, uh, we cannot really talk much about uh, machine learning and, and data science uh, enabled applications, um, uh, data science enabled application of material science. All right, uh, so that was kind of a long introduction to, to this part of my talk. Uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into detail. I already talked about the, uh, the uh, experimental flow that we often pursue in materials um, research at NL, uh, from the position of sample libraries to post-processing and, and, and characterization. There is an equivalent, uh, uh, in addition to this research and sample flow, there's an equivalent data flow, uh, where we have digital data collection uh, coming from the computers that are connected to each of the deposition processing or characterization uh, steps. Um, uh, as well as metadata collection. So I would like to then distinguish these two um, concepts here, digital data collection, I would be referring to as the uh, research and data infrastructure that collects the actual research data, for example, extra diffraction patterns uh, or conditions of the deposition uh, uh, recipes that are generated by the computer or by the control programs and the uh, harvested in what's called data warehouse. And then um, metadata laboratory, metadata collector that enables uh, metadata collections. Uh, so besides the things that uh, can be captured by computers, such as the position recipes, there are experimental details and experimental motivations and other things that are uh, human generated and hard to capture in computer control way. So you also have this laboratory metadata collector with the data captured in HGM. It's kind of web application for collecting synthesis conditions and things that cannot be captured by the computer. So both digital data stream and metadata stream are equally important. One provides the data, the other one provides context for the data uh, and the integral part of this research data infrastructure I talked about today. All right, so uh, let's now uh, take a quick look at the digital data flow component of the RDI. So collecting data from the uh, instruments. Uh, I already mentioned a data warehouse. Uh, it's an art of automated harvesting uh, of, of, of data and metadata in temporal archive from different instruments. So basically all the instruments that we have um, in our lab and then also other labs, the position characterization instruments uh, are connected to a central server that uh, uh, looks for uh, files that, that can be, uh, that have been generated in computers and, and harvested in the time archive. So um, that's what it is. Uh, extract and form load process indicated here by these uh, uh, figures is the process that only selects the files that are relevant to a specific team or specific project, like in our case, all the uh, files that uh, have been generated on instruments in high throughput spatial resolved um, measurement way, um, and uh, arranges them in a relational database, HGM, 
that uh, organizes the samples now not by the instrument that they come from and the date at which they have been generated, but by the sample. So uh, for example, uh, this HTM would contain one entry here, the route sets and sample, and then we'll have composition uh, information for that sample, the synthesis recipe, the X-ray diffraction and properties. Um, we have application programming interface as well uh, that is used to uh, talk to between uh, this relation database and the HTM, the web application that um, uh, I'll show you. And this, uh, uh, this whole infrastructure here is not something that has been built over the last uh, year or two, it's something that we've built upon and improved in the last 10 years. It's a result of 10 years of this inglorious data plumbing that I was talking about in the uh, beginning of the section of my talk. Now, if you open the food a little bit even farther, and uh, for, for those who are interested in coding, ask how this has been implemented in the computers. Uh, these are just some uh, highlights of the uh, software languages uh, that, that have been used. So uh, a lot of things in the data warehouse here have been coded up in, in simple Linux and C++. Um, we have a lot of Python and R code that is uh, in the ETL process, the stack extract transform load process, and then uh, again, lots of uh, uh, Python, long Express, Node.js, and then Jupyter notebooks uh, here in the, in, for the API and the interface uh, with the HGM. Um, another dimension of it is uh, how much time, I guess, we've put in all of this. I mentioned it's been a long process the last decade or so, but really it's a very uh, small fraction of time that each of us have contributed to this. Uh, it's probably around 20% of uh, collectively of engineers' time or last 10 years for and uh, less years than that for further aspects here. Um, so it's uh, really uh, the sustained small investment in this infrastructure that this has enabled the, the way it currently works, not one time uh, big effort and, and big funding. I think this long term commitment and long term investment by multiple people and continuity is something very uh, unique and, and quite necessary for uh, doing, uh, instituting things like this at other universities or research institutions. All right, so uh, enough of flowcharts for now. Let me just show you a few glimpses or highlights of an example of the tools that I've been talking about. So what is Data Warehouse? I mentioned it's a uh, time sorted and instrument sorted archive of files that have been uh, pertaining to, dif to different projects. This is what it would look like from research or my point of view. Uh, uh, the web interface of it looks like a web page, kind of like you would see maybe on a box or Dropbox. Uh, it's folders uh, that are sorted in different ways by the name of the lab and by the name of the instrument. And if you dig deeper into these different instruments, uh, you would see uh, different subfolders corresponding to different dates in which the uh, data can be retrieved either by research looking to download the data, analyze it manually, or in automated way uh, by the extract, transform, and load process. Um, so what is now extract, transform, and load process, or what it looks like uh, uh, from a research point of view? Uh, well, here I don't have uh, too many uh, screens to, to show, except, I guess, a, a GitHub repository of uh, various kinds of code that, has, uh, that supports this extract, uh, transformation, and loading process. Um, so the purposes are different. Um, uh, I, I guess the idea of this code um, in these three steps is for extract is to uh, take the relevant folders of high throughput data from the data warehouse and uh, uh, file to special uh, HTMDB related repository based on the uh, file name and file name convention that, that we use for naming our high throughput experimental samples. Then extracting the data out of these files. Uh, sometimes these files are pro proprietary. There was a lot of uh, kind of reverse engineering and hacking that had to be done for some especially diffraction related file formats. Uh, so that can be uh, organized into a, a relational database in sim with simple ASCII files that are human readable and interpretable. And finally, um, collating individual pieces of new data uh, uh, around a single sample uh, identifier and uh, so that they can be uh, either uh, correlated, for example, correlating composition and structure of samples or, or structure and the processing conditions or convoluted. For example, taking the thickness that has been extracted from one measurement and convoluting it with the optical transmission reflection that has been collected from a different measurements into uh, an absorption coefficient that can be calculated from these two quantities. Now, this ETL process has been built over the last maybe four or five years, um, but it actually has uh, it builds or it has been designed uh, using, using Python and R um, uh, you, uh, using the blueprint from Combi Eager. So let me sell, tell you a few words about Combi Eager. There's actually a separate paper about this. I'm not going to go much into detail uh, on this one, but it's the open source um, data analysis package for high throughput experimental research that we've put out. It's uh, written for uh, 
Eager Pro uh, software package that is quite common among different research institutions for data analysis and its specific plugin, a lot of code, well-documented code, I should say, uh, that uh, enables high throughput researchers to uh, basically do ETL in, in their own computer uh, kind of semi-manual way to load data from different instruments, perform mathematical operation in them and cross correlations and then generate uh, publication quality plots and figures that could go into more conventional data dissemination streams such as uh, journal articles. There are some uh, features and benefits here of this combi. I'm not going to go into this uh, only to say that the ETL, this very important part of the research data infrastructure that um, uh, we have it and has been built basically mimicking this combi eager. And um, this is open data software package. So you're very welcome to use it on its own or look at it as a blueprint for uh, constructing research data infrastructure and ETL processes at your own institution. All right, finally, let me say a few words about lab metadata. The collector. It's another piece uh, that I mentioned a couple of slides above in these flowcharts. Um, what Lake Metadata Collector is, is, the, is a web-based uh, form to, tool, the presentation of it at least is web-based, that allows capturing synthesis metadata that is difficult to capture otherwise uh, because of the manual nature of the, the position, some of the position tool that we have, or incomplete uh, capture of um, the position conditions by uh, more automated deposition tools that we have. It does require human interaction with input. So uh, basically, there is a web link to which uh, which a researcher can access from uh, their laptop as they run their experiments uh, that lets them fill out basic information about the uh, sample labels that they are generating, what precursor or target materials that they use, what gases or, or other processing conditions such as temperatures that they use during their process uh, in order to uh, provide the context of the X-ray diffraction or, or composition or property data that has been uh, collected for the sample library. And it's really, uh, I think, uh, this, this piece of very strong lab metadata and the synthesis recipes that we, we, we have that uh, I think sets uh, aside the final product that we have a high throughput experimental metadata database for many other databases that uh, occur to it, um, uh, 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 that, that happen um, that happened last many years and can be found online. Um, maybe one thing or one comment I must make on this um, page is that uh, for people that may try implementing something in, in the future, maybe try something that in the past, uh, you probably, you will find, or you may be aware of the challenges that will take motivating the users that run experiments, doing any additional manual work that requires, uh, uh, that um, enables data capture, metadata capture, um, one thing that with which we got around this problem is that this web-based form is extremely simple to fill and can even be pre-filled with previous experiments. So it really takes very small time, a uh, matter of seconds for the users to fill out this form, to capture information from the new experiment that they run. And second motivation, um, uh, carrot-like motivation is uh, easy access to the output files that result from this lab metadata collector. Of course, it goes into uh, 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 data warehouse and, and high throughput experimental metadata database, but it also generates a computer readable JSON file that can be loaded directly into Combiger that many people in at least in our lab use for the analysis of this data. So uh, users do uh, like this because they uh, basically can capture in a computer readable way uh, all the information about their sample and load it in a very simple way into the analysis program that they use, uh, motivating them to create this record in the first place. So it's, it's kind of carrot aspects of how this has been implemented from, from user interaction perspective. Uh, there's always a bit of a stick aspect as well. Uh, I think it's important uh, to have research, uh, researchers around PIs at the university, so staff scientists at annual that are cognizant and are committed to the data preservation and the data science and open data concepts and uh, reminding users uh, during group meetings or or other events um, about the necessity uh, of filling out this information for their benefit and for the uh, data publicity benefit and, and sometimes even mandates for finding energies um, is a stick aspect of the uh, of this endeavor of uh, creating strong metadata records for many samples that we draw. All right, so that was another kind of uh, bit of a tangential comment where I do think it's very important for uh, if people want to try to replicate something like this in other labs. So let me now just summarize everything that I told in this uh, part of the talk about research data infrastructure for HGE. A lot of it has been about data plumbing and glorious part of, uh, of work uh, uh, that underlies modern data science and its application in material science. 
Um, this is a high level uh, flow chart of what it looks like. We have uh, multiple instruments here that, from which the data is being automatically harvested and put into MCCS data warehouse. We do have, um, and that's that data collection, uh, digital data collection process. We have extract, transform, and load ETL process that takes relevant files for a particular sample or particular projects, uh, puts them in a relational database, extract the most important information out of these files to enable cross correlations uh, with the uh, with with each other uh, to derive structure property or property processing relations of materials. Uh, the place where they are arranged is called, in our case, high throughput experimental database. It's a relational database uh, that is publicly available. I'll talk in the next part of my uh, talk, and then. Um, uh, also, we have laboratory, laboratory metadata collector that feeds this relational database with the uh, metadata rather than digital data, the kind of things uh, that are very otherwise difficult to capture and used to be written by hand in, 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 in notebooks. Okay, so that's uh, mostly what I've talked about so far. Let me now, uh, in the next couple of slides, say a few words about the, uh, the rest of it, kind of the product of our data science and data plumbing endeavors. And that's how to put experimental database um, and its uh, application programming interface, API, web platform for accessing it, and, and, and related uh, examples. All right, all right, so that's what the next section is about. This work has been described in the scientific data paper a couple of years ago. Uh, and has been done um, again in strong collaboration with my I'm a geo scientist, but my uh, uh, collaborator and this was Caleb Phyllis, he's a data scientist uh, at Anel. Has been around for a while and has been funded um, through a project led by uh, John Perkins. All right. So why were we interested in creating this uh, high throughput experimental materials database? Uh, besides the fact we can just do it, right? Because we have research data infrastructure to do it. There's actually very good scientific reasons to do it. If you think uh, about what's currently available in terms of materials databases, um, I would argue that um, categorizing these databases in, in terms of data size and data diversity leaves a couple of blank spots here. So uh, databases, for example, like ICSD or ICDD are very large. They can contain tens of thousands of, of entries, but they are uh, not too diverse. For example, uh, only structure would be recorded in the crystallographic information file stored in ICSD. On the other hand, um, there is lots of information about structure, stability, property synthesis um, in journal articles, but there is a lot of many of them, and people do a good job these days in trying to extract this information by uh, natural language processing. Um, but um, the the number you kind of have to do it one at a time. These journal articles, and and um, therefore the number of these little data sets, uh, even though there's many of them, uh, the amount of information of them is small. There are also things kind of in between. For example, there's lantern burston uh, database uh, with uh, some properties, uh, but perhaps without the synthesis conditions, uh, which can be found in articles. Now, uh, in, in last maybe 10 years, uh, this landscape have shifted a lot. Um, if you look at all the computational databases that emerged, including materials project, Dayflow, Lip, OxyPMD, and else MedDB, uh, they do provide structure, stability, and property information from computational point of view rather than experimental. However, they still uh, are computational data. So that some people raise questions about um, accuracy and, and fidelity of the data. And there is very limited synthesis information in this data. You cannot really go into the databases and find out how to make the material that you want to make. You only can go and find and learn about materials properties. Uh, and then you're kind of left on your own figuring out how to make the material that you want to make so that it has the properties that you want. So we do think that there is a room here in, uh, in having uh, large and diverse uh, experimental databases that contain all of this information, including the synthesis conditions. And uh, that is our motivation for um, creating HDMDB, uh, which we published in 2018. It's still publicly available at this link and it's uh, kind of second or third incarnation. And many others have followed since this time. There's a MEAT database out of Caltech, Hybrid 3D from Duke and, and, and probably uh, others, including uh, those that you are guys trying to set up as a part of your consortium. All right, so here's some information as of, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago about what has been contained in HTMDB. We have a couple of thousand uh, libraries, 7,000 libraries that translates uh, into more than 300,000 of samples. Uh, about half of all of these 300,000 samples has been characterized in one way or the other. 
with uh, approximately half of them have been measured by composition measurements, uh, more than half in structure, as well as optical, electrical, and other properties, small fraction of them. Uh, if you look at it from kind of chemistry periodic table point of view, this is a list of the uh, elements that um, have been explored uh, so far. And it's, of course, uh, currently growing. Uh, we see that some of them are here, like zinc and copper and tin and other uh, earth abundant elements that uh, have been historically important for, for clean energy applications, but there are a really broad range of them. And these are only metallic elements, as I mentioned. Often these metals are not metals themselves, but rather they are constituents of the compounds in the oxide, nitrite, sulfide, phosphide, and other forms. So uh, bottom line here that the HGMDB that we created, even as it was a uh, year and a half ago, uh, is comparable in size to computational databases, so hundreds of thousands of entries, uh, with one important distinction that is actually experimentally derived data, and that it has synthesis recipes, so synthesis conditions used to generate the materials and measure its properties. Here's how you can uh, yourself take uh, use of HGMDB, uh, simplest ways to just go browse it online, go to hgm.anil.gov, We'll see uh, a periodic table like this where you could click uh, uh, on entries uh, on, on elements that you like and check out uh, what hits that you get. If I do it, for example, for zinc, tin, titanium, and oxygen, some ternary oxide, uh, you would find a number of entries here uh, that you could sort uh, and, uh, by, in various ways, by synthesis conditions or, or the date it has been made or how it has been made. Um, then uh, based then on selecting the uh, libraries that you would like to visualize, the sample that you like to visualize, you could uh, make custom plots here. For example, here's for one sample uh, library, set of X-ray diffraction, optical absorption spectra, or you could make also cross-correlation plots. Uh, for, for example, plot thickness of, of the library here as a function of X and Y, so spatial coordinates to the library. We make cross-correlation plots of, um, in this case, visible transmittance versus thin content, or I don't know resistivity as a function of conductivity, which of course is a, 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 a line in this particular um, case. Another way to um, access this data is through API. I'll say about this in a moment. Um, so, in for example, uh, in 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 web UI in the web user interface that I just showed you, the way to visualize synthesis conditions would be uh, by clicking the sample library. For example, for the one that I just highlighted, number seven seven oh seven, you would find uh, the the position materials that have been used to creating the ternary library: zinc oxide, the tin oxide, and titanium oxide. The powers that have been used to to supply to these materials uh, to these targets uh, time temperature and other factors that have been used to process this. If you're more uh, data science inclined person and, and less interested in finding the specific growth recipe for given materials, but rather would like to do some data science with the data, you don't have to go to hgm.anl.go, you can go straight to hgmapi.anl.go and then uh, basically query this API um, using uh, well-documented uh, comments um, uh, or download, for example, JSON file that would let you um, play with this using Python or your own uh, analysis routines. Uh, we also have API examples of how, how to talk to HGM through API. If you go to this GitHub page, uh, we have some Jupyter notebooks here that show you some basic queries if you think that the documentation of the API itself is not sufficient to enable you to do some meaningful data science. Uh, okay, so that's that's a resource, right? That's a product of the research data infrastructure. Um, the Proof of its usefulness, I guess, is then using it. So uh, let me just show you a quick uh, couple of quick examples of data science that we ourselves have done um, to demonstrate its use. Uh, the purpose of this internal funded project was not really to do data science, but rather to build the infrastructure and to build the database. Uh, but as a proof of concept, we've, we've done some data science here. So uh, this is uh, different, uh, show, shows you uh, some statistical analysis of chemical composition that we have in our database. This is the pie chart, similar to the bar chart I showed you uh, earlier about fraction of different elements that are in um, have been measured by X-ray fluorescence for composition. Uh, and there's about 70,000 entries here that have been measured. So it's not a very useful plot. It just tells me what elements we have. Uh, what we've done is apply the uh, T-distributed statistic neighbor embedding algorithm or t algorithm to this uh, large composition data set and we're able to cluster this multi-dimensional, so 50-dimensional space, you have 50 elements here in basically two dimensions, uh, reduced dimensions, X and Y, uh, where now each blob of materials here represents a ternary uh, diagram where there are three elements uh, with composition gradient 
each line corresponds uh, uh, to a binary composition spread and each dot corresponds to a pseudo unary um, material. And uh, what it lets us do is understand the uh, relation in this multi-dimensional space between different uh, chemistry that we've uh, made, which can enable uh, new insights about how to synthesize these materials and which materials are more related to the others than, than others and extract uh, more chemical insights into uh, the data that we have in HGM DB. So that's chemical composition for crystal structure. Uh, the problem that we faced uh, is that uh, as many of you, um, some of you might have, have seen in literature is that uh, an analysis of high throughput experimental diffraction sets is very challenging. For example, this is just a snapshot of 1000 X-ray diffraction patterns. And it used to take uh, 30 hours for somebody like me or, or a student or postdoc to sift through this and to really try to make sense out of it. Uh, we have uh, developed algorithms that enable us to apply machine learning techniques uh, such as spectral clustering uh, to deconvolute these X-ray diffraction patterns into um, phase diagrams that make sense and correlate them with composition. It really takes uh, now more than 30, like 30 seconds than rather than 30 hours to go from a composition map like this to convolute with X-ray diffraction patterns, find the uh, using spectral clustering the uh, connection between the neighboring points and then um, cluster the results into the three distinct um, zones here, right? So we have phase A, phase B, and phase C in this ternary diagram. It has been used as an example to, um, to demonstrate this uh, algorithm. We also have done similar um, uh, applications of data science to not only composition and structure, which are kind of, and synthesis, which are bread and butter for uh, for materials discovery that we do, but also for some more practical application. For example, a couple of years ago, we published a paper uh, where, in which we have description of the uh, algorithm and the workflow that uh, takes the optical absorption spectra that, that we have uh, convoluted from thickness and transmission and reflection measurements in our database uh, and extracts uh, uh, quantities from it, such as band gap. Metrum is very important quantity because that, that's something that actually can be also calculated from uh, computational sources. And, and uh, we also have done a bit of analysis in this paper to uh, show how the measured and uh, analyzed and interpreted in different way experimental data correlates or doesn't correlate with the experimental, with the theoretical calculated band gaps. Uh, finally, this is actually one of the most interesting uh, applications here that I like. Um, we're able to uh, apply very simple random forest-like methods to uh, statistical analysis in, in supervised learning way uh, to electrical conductivity, uh, where we have a couple of tens of thousands of uh, samples that have been measured. We're able to do the prediction conductivity, develop model that does the prediction conductivity based uh, and, and which has very good correlation with actual measured conductivity for the samples. It's a you know standard supervised machine learning program. We have here used a 10 uh, fold cross validation method with drawing 25% of the sample libraries uh, on a scale of a couple of tens of thousand data points. And what we found from the uh, creating this model that we could predict the conductivity within maybe one or two orders of magnitude. Um, you could say, ha, huh, one or two orders of magnitude is very large, right? It's a factor of 10 or 100. You may say so, but uh, in reality, the uh, diversity or the broad range of conductivity that we have in our database uh, ranges over maybe 10 or 12 orders of magnitude uh, really, I think, um, makes this um, this model attractive for predicting, at least in a rough way, whether material would be insulating or conductive. And doing so with a simple machine learning model um, uh, is particularly useful because uh, actually from theoretical point of view, uh, from computational point of view, it's very difficult to predict conductivity. Uh, that's something that you could calculate, but something not that you would do on the same, every single material in a crystallographic database and put in a public um, uh, domain database, such as materials project, right, for lip. So doing it based on experimental data with machine learning models is uh, maybe uh, not a competing way, but a unique way of uh, predicting conductivities for, for materials and something that would not have been possible unless we had a very strong uh, training data set based on experimental data. So that's a summary of uh, this part of my talk. We have a large experimental database, more than 300,000 uh, entries of materials, composition, structures, and properties. Uh, it's accessible using the web UI at hgm.no.go or uh, using application programming interface for data scientists of you in the audience. Um, it's welcome. Uh, you're very welcome to go and explore it for your own, do your own data science with it. Uh, we uh, have shown, hopefully, by a few examples of uh, our own machine learning on HGMDB that these large data sets enable scientific discoveries using relatively simple and, 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 and off-the-shelf type of 
um, statistical analysis tools, both unsupervised algorithms like TSNI and supervised uh, algorithms like uh, Random Forest. We do hope that this HTM will enable application machine learning algorithms to experimental rather than computational materials problems and, and, and sets a precedence for how uh, exactly this uh, can be done. Um, and uh, maybe last point I make in the context of this uh, talk uh, before I go into final summary and conclusions is that all of what I just showed you in the last section would not have been possible without research data infrastructure, without the previous section of my talk where I was talking about the lab metadata, collector data warehouse, and other components of the uh, RDI research data infrastructure that we've built at the over the last 10 years. All right, so this is, I think, uh, a quick summary of everything I, I've talked about today. I showed you examples, uh, introduced the materials discovery efforts at annual high throughput experiments, and showed you just one single example of how high throughput experimentation can be applied to problems relevant perhaps to your own research, such as 2D materials, calcogenoids, and, and their header structures. Uh, I talked about how the high throughput experiments that we do at annual necessitates uh, developing research data infrastructure to remove the bottleneck that often uh, arise from doing high throughput experiments and, and spatial result characterization and enable as fast and facile data analysis as uh, data generation, data collection. And finally, I showed you one specific benefit of this uh, high throughput experiments and research data infrastructure in the, uh, in the face of this high throughput experimental database, a public database that contains more than 300,000 points uh, with composition structure properties and especially important synthesis conditions. Uh, it's a very unique tool from that point of view that uh, uh, data science here can be applied not only for creating a structure property relationship, but to complete the material science triangle and really understand how uh, structures and properties are born out of uh, synthesis conditions and processing conditions. Something that is extremely uh, difficult to do otherwise on a solid, uh, large data scale with much modern machines uh, learning and data science tools. Um, that's my summary slide. Maybe I'll finish with the future direction slide just to give you a glimpse of where we headed in the future. Uh, we currently actually do not have any external funding uh, for either uh, of these uh, uh, directions. So any ideas or suggestions offline after this talk would be also welcome. But uh, the thing that we're interested in is integrating the experimental database like HTM that we have with computational database uh, such as materials project or perhaps uh, annual MATDB, uh, materials.annual.gov, that's the link for it. And it's a computational database, which has a lot of useful information, including accurate, and I emphasize accurate uh, stability calculations for the materials, as well as accurate uh, property calculations. For example, GW bank apps for many semiconductors and insulators. Another research direction that we're very interested in is using the data that is contained uh, in um, HGMDB, enabled by the research data infrastructure to uh, perform perform autonomous rather than automated experiments. Automated experiments is better than better for us. We've been doing it for last, uh, me for last decade, then for the last two decades. Um, uh, and I think taking it to the next level and going from automated experiments, which reduce human labor to autonomous experiments that can drive themselves, coupling this automated experiments to computer algorithms that are controlling the experiments itself and making the decision about which next materials to make. Uh, is the next big step uh, for us that we are very curious about. A lot of people do it well with uh, organic materials, small molecules, polymers, the stuff that is kind of easy uh, from, from the chemistry synthesis point of view, uh, not so much with the fancy deposition tools, each of which uh, costs a lot of money and, and, and has high stakes of, of, of being um, uh, broken. So we do hope that to do autonomous inorganic synthesis experiments uh, here at NL uh, moving forward. Uh, that's just inspiration though. Um, and um, I'll, I guess I'll just leave you in the end uh, with the summary and conclusion slides. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll uh, welcome any of your questions. I think we still have about 10 minutes, uh, either from the chat if somebody could read them out or uh, online. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for your um, great talk. So if anyone would like to ask a question, there's no chat in the box. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself and then remute after you ask your question. Yeah, so, so one question I have is, um, you know, if you go into a new class of materials like, um, you know, inorganic molecules or something like that, how difficult would it be to adapt, you know, all of the back end processing and everything to something that's different than the types of, you know, growth chambers that you have currently? A very good question. Thank you. Um, let me perhaps go to the 
uh, part of the talk that was talking about this. You're talking about the research data infrastructure, right? Um, yeah, mostly. Right. I think that the data content uh, of of well, that pertains to inorganic molecules, of course, will be very different. The synthesis techniques are very different. The types of characterization that you do is very different. You know, we do a lot of X-ray diffraction for extended crystal structure. Uh, people do a lot of spectroscopy on, on, on molecules to understand what they are. Uh, so data will be different from material science point of view. From data science point of view and from mathematics point of view, I think that uh, these data are just data, right? You know, they are scalar data, they are vector data, they are matrices. So handling them uh, from, from computer science or mathematical science point of view would be equivalent. And I would rather say, I'll also say that the basic building blocks of research data infrastructures would be similar. Uh, you still got to have your instruments connected to some central repository, like an archive or warehouse where the data is stored and harvested and cataloged. You got to be able to sort and link this data to build structure property relationships of molecules, in this case, not materials. And you should be able to have analysis of this data in a facile way, uh, access the data uh, through API for analysis in Python or web UI or, or, or loading it somewhere else in the tool that is convenient for the user. So basic building blocks, uh, uh, are, I think, would be the same despite the difference of the data content. And then um, <clears throat> mathematical, that even the data content would, would be similar, right? You know, you're talking about the X-ray diffraction pattern versus uh, spectroscopy, uh, FPR spectroscopy for, for a molecule. Mathematical, it's one and the same thing. That's that's my uh, take and there are probably also devil, you know, I should say devil in the details. And once somebody goes into that endeavor, there's other smaller subtle differences that could be discovered. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So it, it sounds like it's mostly on the front end of just being right. able to get it into the database. Yes, I, I would say so. And maybe I should also mention that, you know, I'm talking here on behalf of Materials Discovery team at Daniel, where we've done a lot of this with uh, materials, but my colleague Kelly Phillips and other data scientists at Daniel uh, have uh, implemented simpler data handling um, infrastructures for other parts of Enel. Enel only doesn't do inorganic materials, materials discovery, but there are people that work on, on uh, I don't know, um, OPD, for example, materials used to work um, small molecules for photovoltaics. There are people that do catalyst uh, and enzyme synthesis for bio research and for cellulose, cellulose conversion. And uh, many, uh, you know, with varying degree of success, many of these other laboratories have also been more or less uh, implemented to have their own research data infrastructure using more or less a similar template, collecting the data, transforming, loading, and extracting the data, and then displaying it and analyzing it. So there is also somewhat proof to what I'm saying. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, for the uh, the electrical conductivity predictions, um, is that a pure machine learning process or is there any theory coupled into that? It's the quick answer. It is a pure machine learning process. Okay, and so then, for example, if you had a, a different material, so you say that one of the things you're looking at is chemical composition. If you had a, a chemical composition which it had never seen before, it would be impossible for it to make any predictions. Is that? That's there. Yes, that that's yeah. a fair assessment. But I do think it's a very interesting possibility to couple the model that I'm talking about here to the broader set of predictions, not necessarily for conductivity, but for things like effective masses, surveillance band dispersions mm -hmm. that exist in theoretical databases to see if this uh, uh, model that we have here can be transferred out into a larger and broader set of materials. You know, having 300,000 samples is good here. I guess maybe smaller number because not for all of them, their properties have been measured, but still uh, the amount of data and the diversity of data, computational data databases is way, way bigger than that what we can uh, offer here. Maybe not way, way bigger these days, but still bigger. Computers yeah. are still faster than experiments. So uh, that's kind of, I guess, pertains to one of my future research direction, I think coupling theoretical experimental databases, doing transfer learning among them uh, to expand the broad range, the broadened range of our prediction would be very cool. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much for the talk. It was really nice. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, Eric, and I think that, um, you know, this this training model that he used, if it was a more generalized thing, like you're looking for bilayers or shapes or things like that, then it wouldn't matter um, what the chemistry was as much, right? So in that sense, that sort of generalized model could look for the same shape no matter what the material was. 
right? He had a specific case of electrical conductivity, right. which is, yeah, okay. Thanks for coming, Kevin. Anybody else while we wrap up here? One last chance. If not, I guess I would like to thank you all for attending this talk again. Uh, thank you, Eric and others for the invitation. It's really been a pleasure and an honor to present uh, within uh, this venue and showcase some of the results that we had. Uh, so very much personally welcome this opportunity this morning to kind of try to break away and step away from everything that I've been doing earlier today and for the whole last night and get back into science and think about science at least for an hour. Uh, so thank you very much for both of these things. <laughs>